Question number one. So this is chapter one and two in that little 12, chapter 12 thing we did. State whether the data described below are discrete or continuous. Discrete or continuous and explain why. The numbers of cars, the number of cars, crossing a certain bridge each hour. So, so number of cars. Do you remember what those words are? It's been a while, hasn't it? It's been a couple weeks. So yeah, what is discrete? Yeah, it's countable. I don't know if that word, that phrase is very helpful. Um, you, you, you can number them. Um, how about that? You can number them. I don't know if I said it that way before. So you can, you can individually number them. Whereas continuous, what's continuous? How's that different? Continuous is like, you know, that's for things like weight or length, right? You can't, you can't give an exact, you know, it, it's a whole bunch of different numbers. Like if you said, how much does that pencil weigh? You know, it might weigh 2.3178 ounces, right? It could be any number. You can't just, it's not just one ounce, two ounce, three ounce. Does that make sense, that difference? So, so what do you think on this question then? Number of cars crossing the bridge. Discrete. That's discrete. Correct. Let, now is it, they give me, there's two discrete, huh? Which one is it? Discrete because the data can take on any value. No, not any value. It can't be 1.5. Can't say there's 1.5 cars. Discrete because the data can only take on specific values. Yeah, that, that's a good way to put it. Specific values, huh? Like one car, two car, three car, not one and a half or two and a half. So there we go. Specific values. We good? That's not hard, right? Multiple choice. You could nail that out in a week. Question two. Oh, yeah, recall the bottle of water in cancer example given in the lecture. So there might be something like this. I might talk about the Boy Scouts on the actual exam I hand you. I don't even remember. I have several versions, and I copied it without looking super close. Uh, among the whole world's population, if we consider two groups of people, remember this thing? Those who have bottled water at least one time in their lives and those who have never had bottled water at least once, we find that those who have had bottled water at least once die more often of cancer than do those who have never had bottled water, right? Remember the whole thing? Therefore, bottled water must be dangerous, must be a dangerous cancer agent. Not really, huh? What was the point of that example? So what was the point? So I'm checking if you got the point of that example. So was it correlation does not imply causation? Was it statistical significance cannot be determined over such a long period of time? There's only one answer. I'm not going to have multiple. It's, all, it's only one answer. Yeah, it is that first one. I heard a bunch of you say, yeah, yeah. You're right. That is it. Remember that? Correlation doesn't necessarily mean causation. Huh? Just because two things are connected doesn't mean one's causing the other. Just because the bottled water and the cancer are connected doesn't mean the water's causing cancer. Remember what was causing them both? What was the hidden variable? There's different ways you can say it. It was like age of death or, you know, yeah, because the people that never had bottled water, they usually also don't have good nutrition. They die young, so they didn't have a chance to get cancer. Remember that whole thing. So correlation, so just because two things are connected doesn't mean one's causing the other on that. All right, All right. identify which type of sampling is used to avoid working late. A quality control analyst simply inspects the first 100 items produced in a day. So this is a quality uh, control analyst. He or she is supposed to make sure things are coming out quality. And uh, what he or she decides to do is inspect the first 100 items produced in the day. What do you think? Yeah, that's, that's convenience. The person's just doing what's easy. That's probably not a good way to sample, right? Because things that come out early, you know, if the factory, you want to check some that are coming out later because the machines could get warmer and produce inferior products. And there's all kinds of reasons why you don't want to just sample that way. It's not going to get you to the truth. No, no, I know I'm flying on the Yeah, so, so convenient sampling. Yeah, so that person's doing what's convenient. They're doing what's easy. Maybe what would be helpful is let me describe the other ones. What, um, what is stratified sampling? 
uh, yeah, stratified. Remember, that's what the, uh, what's his name, Gal, George Gallup did, where you break the society into a little America. You have the same number of rich and poor and that live in the city and the country and old and young and different races and all that. Stratified is, yeah, when you break, you break it into groups. Those are called strata. The groups are actually strata. Into groups, the same percentage as the population. You make your sample like a little bitty version of the population. That's the best way to sample. Remember that? That's what George Gallup discovered. And, and systematic, I think you'll recognize that. I think we'll see one of those in a minute. Um, none, that's none. Simple, random, that's just simply random. I think, I think you'll recognize that. Let's go on. There will be a couple more like it. Yes. Yeah, so here's number four. A tax auditor selects every thousand income tax return that is received. Identify which sampling method that is. Yeah, that's a system... Yeah, whenever they do like every thousandth or every hundredth or every eighty-seventh or whenever you see that, you know that's, that's just a system, isn't it? They're just going to grab every thousandth one. Is that what the IRS does? Is that how they decide who to survey? No, they have much more planned systems. I heard they do. They, I mean, they have. All right, so um, here we go, some kind of bar graph thing. A nurse measured the blood pressure of each person who visited her clinic. Following is a relative frequency histogram for the systolic blood pressure readings for those people aged between 25 and 40 years. The blood pressure readings were given to the nearest whole number. Approximately what percentage of the people aged 25 to 40 had a systolic blood pressure reading between 110 and 139 millimeters HG inclusive? All right, so let me give you a second to count. The actual question is what percent, what was it? It was 110 to 139, okay. 110 to 139. So what percent 110 to 139? Do you see what to do on that question? So would it be the middle then? Yeah, right. Here's the 110. Here's where the 110 st starts. And the 139, that must be right before the 140, huh? It must be 120. So it must be... Well, they want us to do all of these bars. All of these bars. Is that making sense? Because that goes from 110 up to 140. That's, you know, 139 is right, <coughs> right before 140. So basically they're asking us, what do all three of these bars add up to be? What's the total percentage for all three of those bars? That's what they're saying. What's the percent for the people between one? Like, what percent of all the people have a blood pressure between 110 and 140, basically? So you see what these numbers over here mean? These are basically percentages. They're just decimals for the same thing as percentage, huh? So this is 35%. You know that. So 35% of the crowd has a blood pressure between 110 and 120. And 25%, this one hits at 25, right? 25, here, I'll fill it in right here for you. 25% of the crowd has a blood pressure between 120 and 130. And how many here? What percent are between 130 and 140? 15 there. So then just add those three up. Does that make sense? So I'm just taking... You know, they're, they're wanting me to go from 110 all the way to 140 and come up with the total percentage of people. So that'd be all these added up, right? I'm just coming over here, seeing the percentages. And just add those three up. And so 35 and um, 25 and 15. What is that? You should use your calculator. 67. Yeah, 75, huh? 75% of the whole group, and it looks like most of the group, doesn't it? The only ones left out are these ones. 75% of the whole group has a blood pressure between 110 and 140, 139, same thing. Is that good? Let's go back and see if they have that answer, 75%. There it is, 75%. Is that okay? Making sense? Questions I can answer on that? All right. So question number six. 
identify the cumulative frequency distribution that corresponds to the given frequency distribution. So, what are they talking about? So this right here is the given frequency distribution. This is a frequency distribution. And they're saying, grab the right cumulative frequency distribution. So it's either option A or option... It's going to be numbered, you know, on the exam we take um, next week, A, B, C, D. So um, this is option C. This is just bubble it. So... Um, yeah, so we want to look and say, is it A, B, or C, or D on that? What do you think? What? They, well, they want accumulative. What does that mean? Yeah, to, to accumulate means to um, add, add up, pile up, huh? To accumulate means to pile up. So basically, it means you take, and, and cumulative, remember we did some of these? I'll go out here and I'll just do it right, right out there. So it would be, the first one would, would stay at 4. The next one would be 4 plus 16, it would be 20. And the next one would add the 60, would add all three of those, you know what I mean? Would be 80, and the bottom one would add all four, and be 100. Remember, the cumulative just adds them up, accumulates them. Remember how that works? That's what a cumulative. So, uh, what is it? Is it A or B, or do I need to go to the other page? <coughs> yeah, I thought so, too, when I first was looking through it an hour and a half ago. They're being tricky on this one, so I don't want you to be tricked. I really don't. I'm getting these off the publishers. I'm not, I'm not sitting around going, ha, ha, ha. I'll trick them here. I'm really not. I just get these off the pub, the people that write the, a book, that another book I use. I just grab their questions. So watch out. They're being a little tricky here. A looks, these numbers are certainly right, but watch. These numbers are here also. And it's, so which one's right? Uh, so option D looks really good, and so does option A. The other two, you know, no way and no way, you know. But which one is it, A or D? Yeah, because they're, they're accumulating over here also. Whereas on A, they didn't. They just kept the left side the same. No, see, when you're, when you're saying 20, you know, when, when the numbers on the right side accumulate, you're saying 20 people have, well, I don't even know what we're doing here. What is it, number, number of cars? Oh, speed? Okay, it's how fast different cars are going through some intersection or something. So four cars are going between 0 and 29 miles an hour. 16 cars are going between 30 and 60 miles an hour. So 20 cars are going 30 to 59. Yeah, that's not right, huh? Instead, it's 20 cars are going less than 60. That's true. Well, is is more that yeah, which includes the less than thirty part as well. So to find it, you basically you add up the totals. And yeah, because cumulative is totals. You got to add them up, but you got to add them up on both sides, huh? In other words, when I go four plus sixteen and get twenty, I'm also realize I'm taking this category and that category, which means everything zero to fifty nine. Right. This this twenty. I think the best thing I could do for you is make it as real as possible. Um, See, it's four cars that are going between 0 and 29, and it's 16 cars that are going a speed 30 to 59. So it's 20 cars that are what? Going between 30 and 59? No. 20 cars that are going 0 to 59, actually, huh? Which, th the way they said it is below 60. Same thing. Below 60. Same thing as 0 to 59. So A is not right because they didn't combine categories on the left. So cumulative means just combining categories, left and right, as you go down, doesn't it? It just means piling up the categories as you go down, both left side and right side. Does that make sense? So you won't be fooled on that in the real exam? I promise the real exam is super similar. Um, not the exact, exact questions, but same number, it's very similar. So D is the right answer because they added up the numbers and they combined the categories on the left. So you add up the numbers on that side, then what do you do on the other side? Combine the categories. So that's what I was saying here. 
if you're going between 0 and 29, if I'm combining these two, then that's cars going between 0 and 29 miles an hour and between 30 and 59. So if you put all those, if you put those two categories, because that's what I did over here, right, is I, I put this 4 and 16 together. That's how I got the 20. So also put these together on the left. So what is the real life putting together? Saying all the cars going between 0 and 29 miles per hour and those cars going between 30 and 59 miles per hour. So that would be all the cars going between 0 and 59 wouldn't it? That's a combining of those two categories, which is another way of saying below 60, right? If you're going 0 to 59, you're going below 60. So the answer isn't A? It's not A. Yeah, so A's not right. A's not right because they only, they only made this 30 to 59. Instead, D is right because they said less than 60. That's correct. That's a combining of those categories on the left. All right. All right, question seven. Use the, fo the following data show the number of laps run by each participant in a marathon. So people are running in a marathon, and uh, there's the laps they ran, and they're, wanting, they're saying, use the data to create a stem plot. Use the data to create a stem plot. So really, it's just a matter of kind of looking careful, I think. You know, which... So on the exam, here's what I suggest. Just kind of go down the line. Just go, okay, 46. Uh, there's, there's 46. There's 46. There's 46. There's 46. Mm, maybe this isn't a good plan. 65, yeah, 65, 65. They all have 65. Um, okay, um, what else could we do? I want to start a limit. Okay, maybe I should look for the differences. How about that? What's different between this one and this one, say? Oh, I see. Like this one has four, two 43s, and this one only has one 43. Which one's right? Here's a 43. Ah, there are two 43s. So this guy's out. Does that make sense? So that one's out. Now, this one has two 43s. Okay, the other ones are all still in, so I eliminated one of them. This is, this is a little tedious, isn't it? It's got to be careful. Yeah, I guess you could do the whole... I'm trying to avoid doing the whole thing, aren't I? Yeah, I mean, you could do the whole thing. What else is different? Oh, yeah, 1577, uh, 1567. Yeah, maybe we should just... Maybe, here, maybe this isn't worth all this. Uh, I'm trying to save time, but this maybe is not the best way. Okay, so I'm just going to do it. Here we go. So 3, 4, 5, 6. So 46, 65, 55, 43, 51. I'm going to have to reorder them too. 48, or maybe we can just look at that point. 57, 30, 43, 49, 30. Yeah, this is easier probably, huh? Let's do it this way. All right. How are they looking? Which one of those is... So this has 1577. Seven. No way. It's 1576, huh? So he's out. This has... Um, why does this one have two fours? That's crazy. I didn't even notice that. That's crazy. All right. Uh, this one's looking pretty good. 33689. 33689. 1567. Yeah, this is it, huh? Yeah. What's wrong with the bottom just to make sure, sure? Oh, right there, two nines. There's only one nine, so he's out. Yeah, I guess we just do it out. So much for my little tricks. Just do it out. That'd be the easiest way. All right. Okay, so question number eight. If you are told that your three-year-old girl's height is at the 66th percentile, what percent of three-year-old girls have a greater height than your girl? Good, so remember how percentile works? It's like a big line of percentages, huh? And they start with 0% here and go all the way to 100%. You know, 50s in the middle. It's just like you line up, and that could be anything. We're doing three-year-old girls' heights. Could be snail weights. Could be anything. It's just taking a bunch of numbers and just lining them up from 0 
through 100, you know. So if somebody's at the 66, you know, they're about right, like around right there, you know, a little, little past half. So if they're 66% of the way along, then how many are greater height? How, where, where's the greater height, people? Right there, huh? So if you're 66% of the way along, what percent is greater than you? Now, this is going to be 100 minus 66. This has got to be 34%, doesn't it? Does that make sense? So there it is. We good? Feel like you could do that on the exam? Where'd you get the 34 at? Yeah, I so saw right there. I subtracted from 100. Yeah, yeah, because... Because the up to here is using up 66%. It's 66%. Kind of like, how about a football game or football seasons? People are doing their, what's it called, fantasy draft. My son was telling me about his last night. So that's like, let's suppose it's a football game. What if I'm watching the football game, watching the football game, there's halftime, and now I'm 66% of the way through the game. That's what the daughter's height is. It's at the 66%. So you lay out all uh, three-year-old girls' heights, Hers is 66% of the way along. So if you're 66% of the way through the football game, what percentage of the football game is left? Well, 34%, huh? Subtract from What percentage of the girls are higher height? 34% ahead. Yeah. So this isn't one that we could have used that formula for? That Which formula is that? that oh, yeah, good. No, yeah, good question. No, we won't, we won't need to do that. Yeah, this is just like... Understanding the basic idea of percentile. No, no calculation needed. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, we'll get to some of those calculation ones. Good, good question. We'll get to some of those in a minute. This one's just uh, what's the concept of percentile? Percentage along the way. So that's what percentile is. Percentile is percent along the way. Percent from the left, you know? 66% 66, 66 of the way through the game, through the heights. So 34% ahead and understand words. So if the standard deviation for a set of data is zero, if the standard deviation for a set of data is zero, which of the following must be true? So again, only one answer. I'm not going to give you, you know, more than one. So only one answer is true. All of the data values are negative. One half of the data values are positive. The other half are negative. All the data values are zero. All the data values are identical. None of these. <coughs> How about All right, we got it. We feel confident. What is it? So, so this is going to how are you feeling standard deviation? And again, I think that's really what's most important. You know, cuz you'll read studies that'll say blah 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 standard deviation. You may never compute one in real life, but you'll certainly read studies. So, do you really get what standard deviation means? Do you feel it? Is it in your gut? Standard deviation, remember that, that has to do with the spread, right? Bigger standard deviation, more spread out data, right? Standard deviation, if you have, um, let me put it this way, if you have more spread out data, then you've got a higher, higher standard deviation. If you've got less spread out data, what do I mean less spread out? More centralized Right? If it's all just kind of hanging in the center, then that would be a lower standard deviation, right? So like on the next exam, if everybody gets B's and C's, there's no A's, but there's also no D's and F's, that would be a very low standard deviation because everybody's right around the middle, not much spread. But if instead there's a bunch of people that totally ace it with hundreds and 95s and stuff, and then a chunk of people that fail it, hopefully not, then that would be very spread out data, very high standard deviation. That makes sense? So more spread, higher. Less spread, more in the center, lower. So, and, and the other definition I gave you is standard deviation is average distance from the middle, huh? Average distance from the middle or the center. Okay, so if that is zero, if there's zero spread, Zero spread, zero distance from the middle. It's all in the middle. All the data values are identical, aren't they? Whatever they are, the average score, everybody got the average score. Like, everybody got an 80% exactly on the exam. 
for example. That would be no, st- no spread at all. Everybody got exactly 80%. That'd be no spread at all, zero standard deviation. Does that make sense? They're trying to fool you with this equals zero, positive, negative stuff. Those are all baloney. It's just, they could all be 80, they could all be 70, they could all be 90. Everybody could have got 90. But if everybody got the same, then there's no spread, and the standard deviation would be zero. Does that make sense? You feel in standard deviation a little bit more? That is our goal. That's why we're spending these evenings together. All right, question 10. Find the standard deviation for the given subject. So here's our first calculation. Those first nine questions were all just kind of like theory stuff, weren't they? So now we're going to actually crank out on our calculator. Let me, let me write these a little bigger for you. 18, 18, 18. So uh, what are we going to do with these numbers? Put them in the calculator, huh? Uh, I think I didn't miss it. Let's see, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9. Yeah. All right, so put those in your calculator and uh, then hit the buttons. So I, it's the S sub X, and I'm getting, uh, what is it, 5.41? So, they, so it'd be this one, 5.41. There's, there's two different ways, and I, I don't want you to get confused between those two ways. So let me write this out really clearly. Notice this is only one list, huh? Just L1. We're not also using L2. So what that means when you go to the final thing to get the answers, you go stat, you know, calc, and one var, and all that, that you're going to just do L1, huh? Yeah. Or if you have the fancier kind that, um, that, that says, what does it say? It says a list... List and frequency list. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Just hit enter. Yeah. Uh, it list, it, you would put L1 here and nothing here, huh? You don't want L2 in there. Because uh, we will in a minute when we do things like um, GPA and stuff. We'll get to one of those in a minute. That's on your sheet of notes as well. But everybody know those two different types? Would it change your answer? You know there it would. Yeah, if you put in L2, it's going to grab whatever's in the L2 list and try to apply that as how frequently those numbers occur. <laughs> Um, I think it'll just give you air if there's nothing in the list. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, yeah, so you can't have L2 in there. When, so when you just have one list, just make sure you don't have anything in the second slot, just L1, or just hit enter. But, again, nothing in the second slot, right? So you getting that okay? 5.41, standard deviation. All right. Okay, so number 11. Find the mean for the given sample data. Unless indicated otherwise, round your answer to one more decimal place than is present in the original data. Okay, so, um, okay, so it, it just wants the mean. So I would just use calculator again. So 26, 12, 100, 45, 126, 84. So it's just one list again, huh? So just put them down L1. So put them down L1 and... See what you get. Be just like the last one, basically. And then you're looking for X bar, huh? That's the mean. The X bar. And that's uh, 65.5. And um, what do they want me to do? They want me to round? Yeah, 60, 65.5, what does that round to? 66, huh? Oh, no, oh, no, they have 65.5. I didn't... That's kind of... Yeah. So, six, they have 65.5. So, I'm going to grab that actual one. Okay, it's kind of confusing words. It says, round your answer, which makes us think we should round, but hold on, read the rest of the words to one more decimal place than is present in the original data values. How many decimals in these original data values? How many decimals do you see here? None. No decimals. And it says, round your answer to one more than was in the original. What's one more? Well, one. Right? Careful reading. That is part of what we want to accomplish in a college-level math class, though, is, is, is technical reading. Precise reading. 
reading exactly what it says and what it doesn't say. That is valuable. So is that good? Does that make sense how it says that? I'm not wanting to fool you. That's why I'm giving you the practice exam so that you'll see it and you'll be ready for it in a week. So it, it is a little strange wording. It, I got this off the publisher's thing. So to one more place. So don't be fooled next Wednesday. One, that then means 65.5 is our answer. Good, does that make sense? Uh, question 12. Which of the following is not a voluntary response sample? Which of the following is not a voluntary response sample? So again, only one answer. Can you, can you read those? So, we're look, so remember the word not. I tried to make it big and bold and clear. A radio station asks for call-in response to a question concerning city recycling. Is that voluntary response? Yeah, those people decide whether to call in or not, huh? The radio station just says, hey, call in, give us your opinion, and people volunteer or don't, right? <coughs> Quiz scores from a college-level stats course are analyzed to determine a student's progress. Yeah, that's going to be it. But let's read on to be sure. A sports website asks users to vote for their choice of MVP. Yeah, it's just on the website. You decide whether to click in or not. That's volunteer. A survey is taken at a mall by asking passerbys if they'll fill out the survey. That's the, they can volunteer whether they're doing it. A local dentist asks her patients to fill out a questionnaire and mail it back. That's volunteer, right? They can do it if they want to. Yeah. So it's this one because those are not volunteer. They're the actual quiz scores the student has, so that's not voluntary. And that the data's already there. What's that? All of them have the word ask. Oh, do they? I didn't notice that. Good eye. Asks, asking, asks, ask. Yeah, good eye. This one says tells. No, no, it doesn't say that. But uh, yeah, good, good eye, good eye, Christina. Question thirteen. Listed below are the systolic blood pressures for a sample of men aged twenty to twenty-nine. Find the coefficient of variation. Coefficient of variation, let me put these here for you. 117, 122, 129, 118, 131, 123. Okay, so I'm getting, so I cranked it out and I'm getting S sub X is um, 5.68039. Oh, three, seven. That's plenty of actually. And X bar at the top, 123 point, you know, a bunch of threes. Y'all getting that? And then the uh, coefficient of variation is S sub X divided by X bar, right? That's what it says on your note sheet there. So to just divide those two. So you're going to have to Type in those numbers separately again on your calculator, and then just divide them. And I'm getting um, 0. 0.046057, blah, 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 blah. Then you take the decimal, move it two places. Why? Because they're all percentages, huh? So two places, so that would be 4.6%. So there it is. Is that good? feel like you'll be able to find that and follow those instructions. Questions on that one? So use the empirical rule to solve the problem. At one college, GPAs are normally distributed with a mean of 3 and a standard deviation of 0 0.6. What percentage of students at the college have a GPA between 2.4 and 3.6? So empirical rule has to do with the uh, normal curve. You don't have to draw a normal curve, but I'm just going to try to be uh, extra clear. So basically it says whatever the middle is, the middle is the mean, 3. And then you go like jumps, one jump each way, standard deviation jump, remember that? And they're saying the standard deviation is 0.6. So if you jump to the right, uh, 0.6, this will be 3.6. And if you jump back, 
2.6. That'll be, yeah, 2.4, huh? So this mark is 2.4. This is 3.6. Now, what percentage of the data are in that zone? 68% of the data will be between one jump left and one jump right of the middle. Mean minus one standard deviation and plus one standard deviation. And that's exactly what they said between 2.4 and 3.6. 68%. Oh, that's disturbing, isn't it? That's the other thing I don't want to surprise you. Man, that's my big mantra. You've heard it a million times. I don't want to surprise you. I will use the none of the above option a few times. How did you get 68%? Oh, that's on the sheet? Number 14? Yeah, so six, Yeah, so let me, let me go on with it, because it might not be that one, so let me show you a little bit more to the story, because it'll be something like this, but it won't be exactly this. What if they said um, something else? If we do another jump, right and left, another, you just keep doing the same jump, you know, the 0.6, the standard deviation. So what's 3.6 plus 0.6? 4.2, that's like what those high school kids get now, like 4.2, and they can, couldn't do that in my day, but anyway. And then, not, not that I was trying, um, minus 0. 0.6, so what would that be? 1.8. And, um, and what percentage are within two jumps each way? 95, yeah, 95. That's, that's what a normal distribution means, is those three percentages. 68 within one jump each way, 95 within two jumps each way, and then we can even do one more. Might be on the test this way. I don't even remember. Yeah. One more 0.6 jump. This would be 4.8. I'm not sure if you can even get that kind of GPA. Um, I think you've got to watch the teacher's car a lot. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. All right. 1.2. So that would be 99.7% of all the data are within three jumps. So that's what it means. And pretty much almost everything is normally distributed, right? I mean, we did men's shoe sizes. And there's also snail weights and blah, blah, blah. So, so if GPAs are normally distributed, then, there's, then 68% are within one jump each way, 95 within two, 99.7 within three. Those are the three percentages on number 14 on your handout. You won't ask us like 0.5 standard deviation or one point. No, yeah, exactly. I won't do anything but these three for now. We'll have another chapter where we get more detail. But for now, it'll just be those three. Exactly. <coughs> Does that make sense? So I might have said, instead of 2.4 and 3.6, I might have said 1.8 and, um, what is it, 4.2, huh? Then it would be those two, and it would be 95%, huh? Right? It will be something like that. Make sense on that? We good? And, oh, yeah, let me get back to the none of these. I will use the none of these. I don't want you to be surprised by that. And there will be a few of them, maybe like three, two, three, something, maybe four. I don't Somewhere, two, three, or four. So two, three, or four of the answers on the exam in a week will be none of the above or none of these. So don't, don't be alarmed. I do that to make sure you're not guessing your way through, right? I, it is my job when I give you my stamp at the end that, that I've checked that you really understand this material. That way I know you're not just guessing because you know the answer is really there. You have to actually calculate because it may not be there. So that's so don't be disturbed. I'm not trying to disturb you, but I know that can be... Um, make you uncomfortable, but know that there will be a few. All right. Okay, the mean of the data set is 4.11, standardization 3.03. Find the z-score for a value of 10.86. Okay, so z-score is score minus mean over standard deviation. Score minus mean over standard deviation. So what's what's um, so the so the z score then will equal the score. That's the ten point. That's the ten point eight six minus the mean. The mean is four point one one divided by the standard deviation three point oh three. So type that in, but remember, um, I mentioned before, but I know I talk at you four hours a week. Um, uh, careful when you type it into your calculator, 
write 10.86 minus 4.11, and then hit enter before you hit the divide. Remember, you have to you have to do that. You have to remember to hit the enter. Basically, hit enter after every operation. So do the subtraction, hit enter. Do the division, hit enter. You got to make sure to hit that enter, or, or it'll it'll. If you don't hit the enter in between, it'll only divide the last number. Remember that instead of the whole thing. It won't do what you want it to do. So I'm getting um, 2.22. Oh, yeah, you're right. It rounds to 2.3, huh? Thank you. 2.27, so it rounded to 2.23. Yeah, so it's right there. Good on that. Okay, 16. The ages and years of the eight passengers on the bus was below. Find the median. So you can do it on your calculator, or you could do it by hand if you want to. I think calculators are nice. <laughs> 11, 22, 46, 40, 35. So you can just put them in, you know, and it, it finds medians as well. You don't have to reorder them or anything. It'll do all that for you. So I just did it, and then you have to go, so after you do the stat, you know, stat, calc, one ver, only, only L1, right, no, no L2, um, I got, and then you got to go down arrow to find the median, I got med, median 25.5, there it is. 25.5. Is that good? All is well. I'll move on. Okay, so number 17. 15 numbers in the data set. Find the percentile for this data value, 42. So, so number 2 on the handout. Number 2 in the handout. Says um, percentile is... Percentile means percent to the left, huh? Percentile is percent to the left or percent below. Same thing. Right? Because, because that's what percentile means. If you're in a big lineup and you're right here at the 30% point, that means 30% is before you. To the left. If you're 30% along the way, that means 30% is to the left of you, before you, below you. Right? That's what percentile means. So they're saying for 42, where's 42? Right here. So what percent are below it? Well, all these numbers are data values below the 42, aren't they? So it says on your sheet there, um, count how many values are below to the left of that value, not including the value itself. So how many numbers here? 1, 2, 3... Four, five, six, seven, eight, nine numbers. Nine numbers are below the 42. So, so it's going to be nine over how many total numbers? 15 numbers. So nine out of the 15 numbers are below the 42. So that'll tell you what percentage of the way he's along, right? He comes after <coughs> nine fifteenths of the numbers. Does that make sense? That's his portion or percentage. So if you divide that in your calculator, you get 0.6, huh? 0.6. How do you change that to a percentage? Two places, 60%. So that 42 is 60% along the list of numbers. See, on these numbers, he's just past half. He looks just past half, doesn't he? He's 60% of the way along. He's got 60% of the numbers before him. So there it is. That makes sense. That's what percentile means, percentage along the way from the left. Questions I can answer? Number 18, find the percentile for the data value. Determine whether the results appear to have statistical significance. In a, um, oh, you know what? My instructions got mixed up. Ignore this. It's, there's the instructions, the real instructions. It'll be clear on the exam. Determine whether the results appear to have statistical significance. In a study of, weight, of a weight loss program, 
four subjects lost an average of 45 pounds, it is found that there is about a 4.2% chance of getting such results with a diet that really does not work. Hmm. So do you remember what, I don't, I don't remember if we've talked much about statistical studies. We may not have talked much about it. Um, so now's a good time to, to talk about it. Statistical significance means, in fact, did I put it on your sheet? Yeah, eight. Eight? I just wrote the word. I didn't say anything. Okay. I just said, make sure you know the word. That's not very helpful. All right. So, yeah, let me write it out. Statistical significance. And then verses, and then down below I'll do practical significance in a minute. Statistical significance, it's um, when there is less... Then, when, uh, let me, sorry, when the probability, when the probability is less than 5% that these results occurred Occurred to have two R's or one? It's one. By chance. Less than a 5% probability that the results occurred by chance. You know what I mean? And we're going to, that's going to really be the, the other three quarters of this class, the other three portions. You know, we're in four units. This is our first unit we're wrapping up. The other three units, we'll be talking about this a ton. This will be what it's all about. We'll be looking at studies, like some new medication, some new whatever, and we'll be saying, hey, uh, they tried it out on 10 patients. It seemed to work better. How do we know it's really working better? Maybe it was just lucky 10 patients that were going to be more healthy anyway. You know, and we'll be all into that kind of thing about how do you know like when, when evidence is strong to make us really believe the new treatment's better, or maybe it was just by chance that it happened to work better on a few people, but it's really not a better treatment. How do you know that kind of thing? Well, that's, that's what the rest of the course really is all about, is ways that people in medicine and law and business and everything decide if evidence is strong or not, statistically speaking. And so when evidence is strong, so I could, I could put it that way. Evidence strong. Statistical significance means evidence strong. Like in a court of law, when they would say evidence is beyond a reasonable doubt. That's another way, if that helps. Beyond reasonable doubt. So when evidence, when the the chance that it was just, when the probability that it was just by chance is really low, right? Because anything that happens in life it could either be by chance or because something's causing it. And if, and if the probability that it was by chance is super, super low, then you become more and more convinced that it wasn't by chance, something's causing it, the new medication's really working, or whatever. You know? So that's statistical significance. The other one, practical significance, is easier. Practical significance is when... The result practically matters. Practically makes, how about makes, a real difference. So let me give you some examples and make that clear. So what if you have a weight loss program, you know, some new weight loss program, and it really works and the people lose two pounds in one year on average. Yeah, that's, that's, who cares? Oh yeah, I'm glad it works, but that's not any practical effect, right? That would be no practical. Even if it works, it has no practical significance, huh? Two pounds is nothing, right? So, or what if you have a new treatment for, um, for having, having people have girls more than boys, right? There's different drugs and treatment ways that doctors try to give. So to, to have, um, to, to raise the chance of having a girl instead of a boy. Raise the chance of having a girl 
instead of a boy. What if it raises it to 51%? What if you, you can spend $10,000 and have 20 visits to the doctor and all these special treatments, and it'll raise your chance of having a girl up to 51%? Let me just go. That's, that's practically nothing. That, again, is no practical significance. That make sense? Even if it works, it's not practically doing anything. So those are the two things we look at in an experiment. Well, that'll be a lot in the rest of the course. Let's get back to this one then. So you got this weight loss program, the four subjects, 45 pounds. That's, that's a lot. Um, it's found that there is a 4.2% chance that it would, uh, of getting such results with a diet that really doesn't work. In other words, that's 4.2% that it's just happening by random chance. There's a 4.2% chance that the people that lost all that weight, they were going to lose it anyway. It wasn't really the diet that we just randomly happened to get a peop, group of people that were going to lose weight anyway. There's a 4.2% chance of that. So which number, which one am I looking at for, for statistical savings? Am I worried about the 45 pounds or am I worried about the 4.2% chance? The 4.2% chance. The 45 pounds would be practical. This would mean it does, it does have practical significance, but they're not asking me about that. If they did, we would say, yes, that does have practical significance. That's a, that's a lot of weight. That practically makes a difference. But what they're asking me about is this. So if that's, that's below 5%, so it's strong evidence. Anytime, it's, anytime there's less than a, when the probability is less than 5% that it happened by random chance, we just got a lucky group, if there's less than a 5% chance of that, we don't believe it was luck. We believe something caused it. The diet really made a difference. Make sense? So that is, yes, that's statistical significance. That's strong evidence beyond a reasonable doubt. All right, so we would say yes. I know there's a couple of yeses, aren't there? The results have statistical significance because the results are unlikely to occur by chance. They're unlikely to occur by chance? Yeah, exactly. They're not likely to happen by chance. Something caused it. It wasn't just chance. Make sense? The other one must say the backwards. Because an average weight has nothing to do with average weight loss. Yeah, it's that one. Make sense? It's statistically significant because it's unlikely to occur by chance. All right, number 19. The weight in pounds of 30 newborn babies are listed below. Find P16. So that's on your sheet. That's... Um, you see where that is on your sheet? Yeah, see how number three says find P40, etc.? Yeah, so, so it's number three on your sheet, on your handout. And so I'll just summarize it in the interest of time here. It basically says take the formula, and um, it says P... Um, it should be P over 100 times N. I blew it on that sheet. So you want to fix that? It should say P over 100 times N. So P over 100 times N. P is 16. So this will be 16 over 100 times N. What is N? Yeah, N is that 30. N will, the whole semester, N will be the total number of data values. So n is 30. So take your calculator then. Take um, 16 divided by 100 times 30. I'm getting 4.8. 4.8. Now, this is where I gave you two options. Option one, so this is a little confusing. If, if it's a whole number, did this come out a whole number? No, it's a decimal, huh? Mm -hmm. So I'll skip that and jump down to the one that says, if it comes out a decimal. That's the second part. If it comes out a decimal, round up. So I'm going to take that 4.8. You're going to round up the 4.8 so it rounds to 5. And careful, the answer is not 5. Now it says round it up. Then grab, you know, the example on the sheet said 12.4 becomes 13. Then find the 13th data value. So it becomes 5. Now find the 5th data value. Remember, it's a locator. 
The five is not the answer itself. It's locating the answer for you. So let me write that. It's a locate because the mistake some people make is they think the five is you know actually the answer. It's easy to make that because you've already done a bunch of steps. You feel like, aren't I done? Isn't that it? But it's one more step. It's the locator. It's saying, go back to your data set now and find the fifth number starting from the beginning. One, two, three. The first number, second number, third number, fourth number. There it is. Fifth number, 6.1. Boom. Does that make sense? So P over 100 times in. P over 100 times in. 4.8. Round it up to five, grab the fifth number in the data set, 6.1. You see, because that number is 16% along the way. Remember what percentile means? That's the number that's 16% down the line. That's what you're finding. It's, part, it's 16% from the start, down the line. All right, shall we move on? Questions on that one? Uh, I want to make two points clear, but I probably should say now. Uh, the 4.8 is rounded up even if it's really tiny. Even if it was 4.1, I would still round up to 5. Does that make sense? I'm not rounding off. I'm not rounding to the closest. I'm not doing the normal rounding where 0.5 goes up, you know, and 0.4 goes down. That's normal rounding. That's not what we're doing here. We, When we say up, we mean up. Even like... 4.1 would go up to 5. Is that good? So I don't want you to get caught in it. The example I gave you on the sheet shows one 12.4, uh, which would normally not go up to 13, but I rounded up to 13. I purposely chose that to be clear. So that makes sense? It's got to round up when you do that. Now, the other ones I want to show you how to do the whole number. What if it had come out a whole number? I think, unfortunately, there's not a whole number example on the practice exam, but there may be on the real exam. I don't even know for sure, but there could be. So let's, let's make one up. Let's redo this problem and pretend it came out a whole number, just so you'll know how to do it. So what if I did my P over 100 times, I don't know, what, times in, you know? And what, what would be one that would come out that way? Oh, yeah, what if I, yeah, let's do P20. Yeah, that'll, that'll come out that way. So let's, do, let's redo it and pretend they asked for the P20. So if they asked for the P20, the 20th percentile, the number that's 20% of the way down the list, then um, I would do the same formula. It's always P over 100 times N. So 20, you know, the, the 20 go right there. Times N, N is still 30, you know, total number of data devices. Then if you do that in your calculator, you'll get 6. Straight out 6. Whole number, huh? Not a decimal this time. Are, are you tracking with me? Is this making sense? So I want to make sure if you look on that sheet, on um, number three there, what do you do in the case of a whole number? Something a little different. You don't round it, right? It's not a decimal. We're not going to round it. What do you do? Remember, that's still a locator. That's still a pointer. He's telling you where to go in the data. You go grab the sixth and the seventh, the next one. That's what I say in the description. little different deal. Add them and divide by two. In other words, average them. Go grab the sixth number and the seventh number. Add them and divide by two. Average them. It's right between the sixth and seventh number. So let's go find now the sixth and seventh numbers. What first number, second number, third, fourth, fifth, sixth and seventh. It's those two. Sixth and seventh. You can... Read all that there. The sixth and seventh number would be 6.1 and 6.4. Add them and divide by two. You should get um, 6.25. So that makes sense? So that may very well be on the actual exam. I, I know it's on some of my versions of the exam. I just don't remember which ones. I got a bunch floating out there. You got one coming Wednesday. So does that make sense on that? So... So two, two ways it can go. If you do your P thing and you get a decimal, round it up, five, and go find the fifth data value. Done. If you do your P thing and you get a whole number, 
Don't round it. You don't round whole numbers, right? Just grab that number and the next number. Sixth and the seventh, add them and divide by two. And remember when you round up, you really round up. Even 4.1, right, would go up to five. We really mean up. We don't mean round, like, no, it's not normal rounding. Good? Links of spiders found on the forest floor. So they went out and they gathered a bunch of spiders that were just sitting on the forest floor, and they measured their lengths, like grabbing snails, like I talked about a couple times. So let me make sure this bar graph is making sense, and then we'll dive into the question. So look at that seven, for example. This is millimeters, and this bar goes all the way up to, to 80, doesn't it? Remember, this is the number of spiders over here because this is the frequency. <coughs> Bar graphs always have frequency on the y-axis. How many? That's always what bar graphs have. So that means there's 80 spiders that are 7 millimeters long. And there's 40 spiders that are, this must be 6, this bar must be 5, 4 millimeters, 3 millimeters, this must be 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12 millimeters. So there's Right, This bar goes up to 40, so there must be 40 spiders that are 6 millimeters long, and there must also be 40 spiders that are 8 millimeters long, etc. And how many spiders are 5 millimeters long? I don't know, maybe 25. I'm just guessing. You know, We don't need to know the specifics, but a little bit less. See, that, see what that bar graph is saying then? It's telling you how many spiders have the various lengths. Okay, now here comes their question. Without calculating, so that's helpful. We're not supposed to, you don't need to. There's nothing we could do with our calculator. What might be the standard deviation? What might be? So this is hitting gut level, which is really what's most important. Do you really feel standard deviation? Is it really making sense to you? So you look at that data set. Can you look at those numbers and right away know that only one of those numbers even has a realm of possibility of being the standard deviation? How do we do that? Well, we, we got to go back to what standard deviation really is. This, this, I got this off the, your guys' quiz. I, I think that quiz, too, is excellent. Mr. Jameson, and I, or Mr. Uh, Jameson Burrell made it. I think, fabulous. I think he did a really good job on that. Uh, really, these, like, these are super good questions. They really go after the meaning. Standard deviation, what standard deviation is, is remember, it's average distance from the middle, right? Average or typical, normal, distance from the middle, okay? Well, think with me for a minute. What, what's the middle? For example, what's the average spider? Seven. seven. That's the middle right there, huh? This is the middle. It's the average spider, seven millimeters. The spider that's um, most, that's furthest away from the center, would be that one or that one. Either way, huh? The 12, the biggest spider, 12 millimeters. How much bigger is he than the average spider? He's 5 millimeters. He's 5 off the middle, isn't he? And the smallest spider, same thing, 5 below the middle. So the, so the most extreme spiders, furthest spread out from the middle, are 5 away. So the average distance from the middle the average must be less than five, right? Because the furthest any of them are away from the middle is five. So the average distance, whatever it is, standard deviation, must be less than five. So no way, no way, no way, no way. There we go. It's got to be the two. Make sense? The furthest things are five away. So the average distance away from the middle can't be more than five. It's got to be less than five. If five's the furthest, then the average has got to be less than five. That's all you need to know. Just that gut level feel. It's a good question, isn't it? It really goes after the meaning of standard deviation. Okay, so question 22 now. And um, they're saying these are some box plots. And it says Sammy makes the minimum salary for a construction worker. So here is Sammy. Sammy's right here. This is the minimum is down here for the 
box plot for a construction worker. That's minimum for a construction worker. And Jamie, Jaime, Jaime, makes the median for a teacher. So it's the teacher. Median is right here. This is the, where the median goes for a teacher. That's where Jaime is. What is the difference between their salaries? So Jaime is right here at 35. Sammy is at 25. So 35 minus 25 is 10. The difference is 10, which is none of these. That difference from here to here between the median teacher and the lowest construction is 10, and that answer is not there. That's a little disturbing. It's none of these. So number 23, got a box plot. It shows 40 students that took a statistics quiz. So which of the following quiz scores could be the 48th percentile? Well, remember, the, this, this is, there's 25, there's a box plot, so there's 25% of all the quiz scores are in this section. 25% of all the quiz scores in this section, 25% of all the quiz scores in that section, and 25% of all the quiz scores in that section. So the 48th percentile, uh, what, what's, what's this mark? This is going to be the 50% mark, isn't it, right here? Because that's halfway through the data. So the 48% is going to be something just below that, just below 29, something like 28 or something like that. There we go, 28. It's got to be just below 29 because it's just below 50%. That's from remembering that all these sections are 25. That's what a box plot always does is breaks the four sections into four quarters for 25% sections. So 48% is just below 50, just below the, just below the median so like 28 is perfect. Okay, so number 24, this is a tricky question. The average weight of the German Shepherd is 485 with standard deviation 57. The average weight of the Labrador Retriever is 282 with standard deviation 21. The average weight of the Poodles, 176 with standard deviation 8. And then they tell us in particular that Rover is 400 grams, and Max is 240 grams when he was born, and Fluffy the Poodle, 184 when he was born. And then they ask us, they say, compared to the other, here, I'll change my color, they say, um, compared to the other German Shepherds, just how small is Rover? Compared to the other Labrador Retrievers, just how small is Max? And compared to other Poodles, how small is Fluffy? Rank the puppies relative to their own breeds, that's the key from smallest to largest. Whenever you get a question, and you will have one on the exam, whenever you get a question that asks you to uh, rank things relative to a group. So whenever you, you know, like, like German shepherds weigh a lot more than poodles, for example, don't they? So if you're, you might be light for a German shepherd, but you're still going to be way heavier than any poodle. So we want to compare, you know, Max, Fluffy, and Rover and um, find out who's really the smallest, medium, and largest, you know, smallest, medium, and largest relative to their breeds. Like within, within German shepherds is, um, who was the German shepherd? It was um, Rover. Is Rover really big, really small? Where's Rover compared to other German Shepherds? Where's Max compared to other Labradors? Whenever they ask you to compare somebody to their group, whenever they say relative, whenever you see the word relative like that, relative to a group, that's always the, the tool that helps us figure that out is Z-score. So you've got to recognize that on the exam. When they talk about relative to a group, they're talking about Z-score. So let's start then and start with Rover. So here I'll do Rover in the, in the green since I started him that way originally. So Rover. 
Rover, uh, now how do you do z-score? It's Rover's weight minus the mean over the standard deviation. That's what z-score means. So what's Rover weigh? Um, I don't see Rover, 400 grams. Minus the mean for Rover's uh, German Shepherd. So the mean for German Shepherds, this is the mean, the average, right? Mean is average. So that would be 485 over the standard deviation for German Shepherds, 57. So do that in your calculator. Remember, when you do that in your calculator, you have to hit Enter and then go divide by 57 and hit Enter again. So let me see what we get here. On my calculator, I'm getting... Minus 1.49. That's Rover's z-score. That means he's, he's 1.49 standard deviation jumps below the middle. He's below. He's negative. So he's below the middle. 1.49 standard deviation jumps. That's... That is what a z-score is. Let's do the next one. Let's do max. So max, same kind of thing. I'm going to take max's weight, his weight, minus the mean over the standard. So rover's, or max's weight, 240, minus, now rover's a Labrador Retriever. Um, what was the Labrador Retriever? There's the mean for Labrador Retrievers. 282, the average Labrador Retriever is 282, and the standard deviation is 21. If you do that in your calculator, remember to hit enter after the subtraction, and then enter again after the division. I'm getting negative 2. So that means two standard deviation jumps below the middle. So Rover, or Max, I mean Max, is really tiny. He's two full jumps below the average Labrador Retriever, whereas Rover is only 1.49 jumps, 1.49 jumps below the average, um, what is it, a German Shepherd. So Max is smaller in his group than Rover is in his group. We got one more to go. Let's do Fluffy. So Fluffy, weight minus mean over standard deviation. What's Fluffy's weight? Fluffy weighing in at 184 minus the mean. What's the mean for Fluff? The mean for Fluff for Poodles? The mean is 176 over the standard deviation for Poodles? 8. So if you do that, you get, um, I think we get 1, don't we? Yeah, just positive 1. Which means Fluffy is... He's heavier than the average poodle, right? See, his weight, 184, is higher than the poodle average, 176. He's plus one, which means he's one standard deviation. He's one standard amount, one standard deviation jump above the middle. You see that? He's above. He's positive. He's above the middle. Fluffy is heavier than your average poodle, even though he's way lighter than the other two dogs because he's a poodle, but he's heavier than the average poodle by one standard jump, plus one. So now they want us to rank the z-scores, like rank these z-scores from smallest to biggest, right? Smallest, then medium, then large. So who's got the smallest z-score? Right here, negative two, max. So max is the smallest z-score of minus two. Followed by the medium would be this one, Rover. Rover has the medium, which is minus 1.49. And the biggest is Fluff here. Fluffy has the plus 1. Fluffy, plus 1. So that's the ranking. Max, Rover, Fluffy. Um, I don't see that answer. Max, Rover, Fluffy. I don't see that. I guess you have to go to the next screen. There it is. Max Rover Fluffy. So the smallest was Max. Negative 2 Z score. The next, negative 1.49 Rover. And then the biggest, plus 1 Fluffy. That's their order from smallest to medium to largest. 
Z-score. That's how they compare to their groups. Max is super small for Labrador Retrievers. Rover's pretty small, negative 1.49. He's below the average for um, German Shepherds. And Fluffy is big for Poodles. So that's how they stack up compared to their groups. So there's the whole practice exam. The real exam will be very similar.